subdural hematoma is the topic. And the best way to start is by drawing a diagram to describe all the layers. So you have the brain, and right on top of the brain sits a layer called a pia matter. And above that, there's a little bit of space. And then you have another second layer, and that is known as the arachnoid matter. And then above that, there's a little bit of space, and then you have a third layer, which is the topmost layer, known as the dura matter. And above the dura matter, directly above it, is the skull. As you can deduce, subdural hematoma is a collection of blood beneath the dura. So it would be this area right here. And this can be easily uh, seen on the CT scan. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what's exactly happening? Why does this happen? The etiology, why would somebody develop a subdural hematoma? Well, there's um, several reasons, but I'll break it down into three categories. We'll talk about infants, we'll talk about the elderly, and then we'll talk about alcoholics. And each of these categories has a reason for developing this bleed, intracranial bleed. So infants, unfortunately, one of the causes is physical abuse. It's quite tragic. And um, children can develop this. And um, this can be um, a consequence of basically the child being hit or sh uh, maybe shaken very violently. Elderly actually developed this because as a person ages, especially above the age of 60, their brain starts to atrophy. And when uh, there is brain atrophy, there are these veins that exist in the dura. They're called bridging veins. And these bridging veins, what happens is, as the brain atrophies, these veins can easily be stretched and this stretching can eventually cause rupture. And that rupture is essentially what is responsible for producing this subdural hematoma, this intracranial bleed. And that's very, very important. That's very commonly tested. Alcoholics, next one. Well, alcoholics, unfortunately, um, they because they have uh, this very poor nutrition and um, uh, alcohol misuse leads to a lot of problems. They can have prolonged bleeding times. And that can lead to uh, this tragic or disastrous effect. Alcoholics also uh, can have brain atrophy, which is interesting. And that cerebral atrophy can lead to tension on the bridging veins in the same way as the elder elderly. There's one other category I wanted to talk about that is people on any kind of anticoagulation treatment. So for example, patients that are on warfarin, uh, people that are on this type of treatment can uh, have bleeds, and that's a very important thing to watch out for. So the most important thing that you'll see on clinical vignettes is how does the patient present. So usually, the chronology is there's some sort of head injury. Now of course, this doesn't always have to be, but usually there is some sort of head injury, maybe a fall or maybe an accident, something like that. And usually uh, they're talking about someone elderly in most clinical vignettes and it's an elderly patient. And then what happens in the acute phase is that the patient is relatively normal. There's absolutely no symptoms whatsoever. But then about two to three weeks later, when sometimes the patient has even forgotten uh, that this initial traumatic event happened, there is a gradual decline in neurologic function, gradual neurologic deficit. And that is a very classic presentation. And what do we mean by neurologic deficit? Well, the patient will have increased confusion. The patient will have uh, maybe some uh, personality changes, uh, drowsiness. And clearly, there's something wrong with the patient and the patient is then brought in to the uh, emergency room. Headache also can be present. Now very quickly on physical exam, what you want to see or look for rather are signs of increased intracranial pressure because the bleed is building up in that subdural space. 
And signs of intracranial pressure, of course, you check the eyes for papilloedema. And um, in babies, in infants under the age of one, uh, you can see a bulging of the anterior fontanelles. So the, those fontanelles that are normally not uh, supposed to be bulging will be so. And that's a, a sign of intracranial pressure being increased. So how do you diagnose this? Well, imaging, of course, CT scan, you know, without a doubt. The CBC can probably also be done. Liver function tests are helpful in alcoholics, but without a doubt, an imaging test as, uh, as quickly as possible once you have a suspicion of a subdural uh, intra or any kind of intracranial bleed. Treatment, now this is one of those emergency treatments, and it's a neurosurgical treatment. A neurosurgeon will be the one involved in doing uh, emergent craniotomy and draining the uh, the blood. The blood is evacuated. And one final point I wanted to mention before I get to the clinical viats is very important about prevention. One of the biggest reasons this happens is falls in the elderly, and therefore uh, one of the biggest aspects of uh, prevention of this is making sure the home environment is safe and uh, that there's nothing that they would trip or fall because if they do the result can be quite devastating so let's take a look at some vignettes see what this looks like 71 year old man excellent health practicing com competently as an attorney he's brought to the emergency room for following a motor vehicle accident a uh, workup including imaging of the spine, thorax, and head is negative, but the patient is admitted for overnight observation. His injuries include several lacerations to the face and extremities, as well as several contusions to the thorax. Three weeks later, he is admitted to the hospital for confusion. A neurologic exam is normal, except he is not oriented to time or place. He can only recall one out of six objects after three minutes. Which of the following is most likely diagnosis? Well. Classic history, presentation of subdural hematoma. As you can see, there was an initial event. He was okay, but then three weeks later, he uh, shows up with this uh, neurologic uh, defect presentation, decreasing mental status, and obviously that re results in him having to come to the emergency room. So the answer is subdural hematoma. Next question. 77-year-old man becomes senile over a period of three to four weeks. He used to be active and managed all of his financial affairs. Now he stares at the wall, barely talks, and sleeps most of the day. His daughter recalls that he fell from a horse about a week before the mental status changes began. Which of the following is the most likely source of the bleeding? Um, well, again, classic. There was some sort of a traumatic event, blunt trauma to the head most likely, and he was okay. And then later, as it says here, three to four weeks later, he develops this gradual deterioration um, of a neurologic status. And then they're asking, where is the bleeding occurring? Well, in that dura area, you have these bridging veins, and they can rupture and lead to a subdural hematoma. And then finally, an 82-year-old man is admitted to the hospital after he started dragging his right leg today. Workers at the nursing home where he resides also noticed that he was not as talkative as usual. Uh, his temperature is 98. His speech pattern is non-fluent. On the right side, hip flexion, knee flexion, dorsiflexion, abductor, hallucis longus were weaker than other lower extremity muscles. Cell counts, chemistries, and coagulations are normal. CT scan of the head shows a 1.5 centimeter left-sided subdural hematoma. His granddaughter arrives after he returns home from the CT scan and is very concerned about her grandfather's condition. Most appropriate next step is. Well, uh, this is a neurologic or neurosurgical emergency. And a neurosurgical emergency uh, involves a immediate craniotomy with evacuation of that blood. And that can only be done by a neurosurgeon. So that would be choice B.